welcome to the Live Your Possible podcast, the show about sparking and discovering endless possibilities where we work, live, and play. A safe place where we can help you peel back the cover to what may be blocking you from being your most authentic and happiest self. Our guest today is Debbie Hampton, an author and educational writer. Debbie recovered from decades of unhealthy thinking and depression, a suicide attempt, and a resulting brain injury to become an inspirational and educational writer on the brain, psychological, emotional, and mental health issues for Hubby Post, Mind Body Green, and more. On her website, The Best Brain Possible, Debbie shares how she rebuilt her brain and life to find joy and thrive again. She wants you to know that you can do it too. You can quickly learn from the steps to a better you in her book, Beat Depression and Anxiety by Changing Your Brain, with simple practices that are easy to implement in your daily life. Improve your brain, improve your life. On the show, Debbie talks to us about her science-based research and how we could retrain our brains to reduce depression and enhance happiness. She is living proof of what can happen when you regain the brain control on an intentional path with actions. Debbie overcame suicide attempts to experience her aha moment, to connect with her instincts, to want to live her life. Now, for anyone currently in distress or has a thought of suicide, contact the 988 Suicide and Crisis Line, which provides 24-7 free and confidential support, or connect with a psychotherapist professional to help you today. Now, for the show, I invite you to listen in to the entire episode and learn how our brain works and how it will grow if you potentially feed it. Debbie, welcome to the Live Your Possible podcast. I'm really excited to have you here. You're such an inspiration. You've been a big part of my book. You were featured in one of the chapters as we think about change and growth in particular with our brain, yet your story is so incredible and how you've gotten to this point. And I'd love to talk about that, but first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you, Darren. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I appreciate your willingness to, to share all your knowledge and what you've learned and what you've been through. So let's just jump right into it. Could you give us a little bit of background about how you got to this point about being such a brain expert? Well, that's a long story, but I'll try to give you the Cliff Notes version. I grew up in a very typical family in the um, 60s and 70s. And as was typical of the time, I had educated middle class parents who had good intentions. But as was typical of that time, I did not learn emotional intelligence or mental health skills what I learned, and like we all do, our brains learn the environments that we grow up in, and they learn, they model what we see. So I learned how to be reactive, how to think um, catastrophically, and in ways that lead to depression. In other words, I I had no coping skills, Mm. and I married my high school sweetheart. We went through college together, And that became a very codependent, narcissistic, he was a narcissist, not me, (laughs) um, unhealthy relationship. And I was married for 18 years, and we moved 11 times during that 18 years, and I'm in states, to follow his job as he climbed the corporate ladder and gained success and uh, power, I shrunk and I became smaller and more codependent and less confident in myself. And I had two sons and became a stay-at-home mother, which as any stay-at-home mother knows, I mean, it's an important job, but it's very sheltering, isolating, and demanding. And I also took care of a brother for two years, I was a caretaker who died of AIDS in the first AIDS epidemic back in the 90s. So all of this is to say my mental health, which wasn't great to begin with, I didn't have any coping skills, went downhill from life events and from my lack of ability to cope and respond in healthy ways or get help for myself. And as is typical, uh, brains aren't born depressed. Depression is a thinking pattern that your brain learns. And my brain learned it through 
patterns and that I emulated in childhood. And then through all the series of events that happened, it, I became more and more depressed. And it's kind of a self-fulfilling feedback loop. Uh, you reinforce the pattern in your brain with different behaviors and thoughts, and you become more depressed. And as I had seen in my childhood with family members, uh, one way to cope with challenging life events is to end your life. So I attempted to end my life. Uh, one time I was living in Florida, and my, my sons were really little, and I didn't do much damage. He fought a restraining order against me, and there were some other repercussions, but eventually we got back together, and I put my life back together. And then I tried again, I think, about uh, five years later, after the ex-husband and I had gotten divorced at my my doing. But even when it's your doing, it's very traumatic. And so I was a single mother of two. Um, I think boys were 9 13 at the time. Living alone in North Carolina, I moved back up here to be with my family. But my initial reaction to getting divorced was to find another man because I had no value in myself. My my value was always in a man. He wasn't what, much better than my first husband. And he was a little bit narcissistic, but emotionally abusive. And I mean, when he broke up with me again, I decided the best thing I could do was in my life. And at that point, I had such a low opinion of myself that I really felt like I was doing my sons a favor because I have heard people say, how could you do that to your sons? But you have to understand that when somebody is that low and has that low an opinion of themselves, they don't think they're doing anybody any good. So uh, this time I tried to end my life and I almost succeeded. And I put myself in a coma. I was in a coma for a week. And when I woke up from the coma, I was severely brain injured. I couldn't speak. Um, I had almost no memory. And I was severely mentally impaired. I mean, I knew that a chair was a chair and a bed was a bed, but my brain couldn't put the disparate parts of what I've seen together and make sense of it. And I didn't know I'd gotten divorced. I didn't know my brother had died. It's like my brain went back to a time before all the pain and suffering. But immediately after the brain injury, my ex-husband sued me for custody of my sons and won and moved out of state with him. <laughs> um, so here I am, severely brain injured. I mean, I couldn't speak. I had absolutely no short-term memory. And now my sons went to live with their dad in another state. And I thought things were bad before, so bad that I wanted to end my life. So well, I had an aha moment. Uh, when my, my other brother at, took me to Hawaii about six months after the brain injury, because I think he just knew that I needed something to look forward to and some, I don't know, something good in my life. And we went to Hawaii, and the very first day we were there, we went snorkeling, and I was a good swimmer. I mean, I was a competitive swimmer all during my childhood. I was a lifeguard all through high school and college. I mean, I was a good swimmer. Mm -hmm. But we put the snorkels on and the fins and all that and swam around this little bay 
in Hawaii. And the bay opened out into the ocean. And where it opened up, the waves were strong and the current was strong. And I was kind of up there at the lip where it opened up. And my fin kicked some lava rock under the water. And it kicked my fin off. Mm. And it was life or death. I mean, I could not, I didn't have the physical coordination I used to have because of the brain injury. And I was gulping water and going under and yelling, help. And my brother saw me and ran um, and said, stay there. I I made it over to a lava rock that was sticking out of the water. And if you know, they are covered with coral, which cuts you. And he was like, stay there. I'm going to go get your sand shoes and a towel. And I saw a little sailboat bobbing out in the middle of the bay. And I thought it was a better idea for me to try to swim to the sailboat. So I actually was able to swim to the sailboat. And I hung on the, the side of the boat yelling for help. And a guy came up above board and looked like he maybe thought he was hallucinating or wasn't sure what he was seeing was true, but he got a little kind of sail, but no canoe or rowboat and rowed me to shore. And needless to say, I never went snorkeling again the whole time we were there, Mm. but it was a valuable experience. And it wasn't until I got home that I realized Okay, six months before that, I had tried to end my life intentionally. And here I was faced with a life or death situation. And I fought really hard to live. And that made me realize that my instinct was to live and that I wanted to live. And that all that stuff in my head that told me I wasn't good enough or that I wasn't a good enough mother or that I needed to end my life was my chatter in my head. It wasn't really me. I mean, it may sound ignorant, but that was the first time I ever really realized that what was going on in my head wasn't me. And I decided from that point on, I wanted to live and I started acting like it. I started seeking out everything I could and learning everything I could about rehabilitating my brain and my body emotionally, physically, spiritually. And it did take years. And I mean, three to five years before I even got to where life was kind of normal again. But what I did was I read and educated myself about the brain. And I tell you what, one of the first books that will help anybody understand is Norman Doidge's book, The Brain That Changes Itself. And it's a book about people born with half a brain or people that had strokes or horrible brain injuries and how they recovered. And it's about how the brain grows and is resilient and how your brain is shaped. And I, after reading that, I thought, here is a manual on how to heal my brain. Now, every brain and every brain injury are different or every brain condition, whether it's depression or anxiety or ADHD or whatever you want to correct, is different. But the basic premise is the same and it's called neuroplasticity. And that means your brain changes. They used to think it just changed when we were kids. But now we know your brain changes from birth to death. And your brain changes. I mean, physically, it changes the form 
and it changes its function, its operational patterns based on input. So that's why I was saying I learned as a child to be reactive and to be dramatic and emotional. And that's how my brain formed. Your brain and every one of us's brain was pretty much shaped by our circumstances and our environments when we were young because that's when the brain is like sponge. It's just soaking up everything. Uh, when you're older, it takes intentional effort to change your brain. And you have to become aware of how your brain is operating, what beliefs, what behavior patterns and reactive patterns are already established. And then you, you need, you decide consciously to change them and you start changing them. And you can't do that. I mean, I'm not special. Any of us can do that. Is I like to say it's like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz had all the red slippers that could take her home the whole time. Well, we all have the ability to change our lives and change our brains. We just have to know how to use it. And it's called neuroplasticity. And we all can use it to make our brains and our lives better. Such a powerful story and so inspirational, Debbie. Uh, there's so many things I'd love to to dig into. You know, I love the fact that, hey, we can change. You know, that's something that I I was really not fully aware of until I started to read your work and understand your story. It was helpful for me as I as I often try to get folks to live their possible, right? So I'm trying to get folks to understand we can rewire, we can do different things, and it's got to be intentional. Everything you just said. And you, you're living proof of this in many ways. Let's go back to when you were in the hospital. And I understand you had to re-teach, relearn how to, I think, even breathe, even figure out how to talk and walk and some of the basics in life. And how did you, how did you have it in you at that point to, to relearn? Was that instinctual again? And how did that go? How did you get, how did you make progress over those six months before you went out to Hawaii? I didn't. As a matter of fact, I had another plan to end my life. Okay. It wasn't until that experience in Hawaii that I realized that I did have a lot to live for mm. and that my brain had been convincing me that I wanted to die. And I'd been torturing myself with the images of my brother dying and taking care of him through the AIDS ordeal and the images, my ex-husband's lawyer in the courtroom saying horrible things about me, but that's our job. But they're in a courtroom saying all these things in front of all your family and friends. And I have no doubt that I had PTSD but I also had very negative thinking patterns and habits, which just reinforced these things day after day and played them over and over in my brain. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, what we're doing is making those connections stronger in our brains so that you get more of the same. And I don't mean to say it's easy. And rewiring my brain and changing my behavior and my thinking patterns took years. I mean, some things are quick and quicker, but I mean, and some things may never really change. I'm still primarily an anxious person, but now I have the tools to deal with the anxiety. Um, and to figure out what is happening and not just react based on my emotions. When you react from your emotions and you live your life from that place, it's most often not going to turn out well. 
I'm convinced that the key to being able to control and guide our lives successfully is being able to control and guide our brains and ourselves. If we can do that, I mean, you're on the road to your goals and to success and happiness much more so than anything else you could do. Now, what are some what are some steps folks can start to think about to be intentional, to unlearn some of the things that we're putting in our minds and to really ease that so we can start to revisit new thinking or rewire our habits or maybe let be less depressed, all the things that you're mentioning. Well, Darren, I just finished a book on using mindfulness as a mental health tool. And I know a lot of people think mindfulness is meditation or this airy-fairy um, spiritual practice. It's not. I'm talking about becoming aware of your thoughts and coming into the present and realizing what you're thinking and how you're reacting and stopping and taking control of that. Um, our reactions and our emotions and impulses, some are programmed, but most come from your subconscious brain, your limbic system, and are based on your fears and your wounds because your brain's first priority is always your safety. So it does everything it can to protect you, to keep you away from anything that made you anxious or scared before. But in this day and age where we don't get chased by lions, it holds us back because it keeps us small and afraid of going after the things that make us happy or the things that we want to achieve. It's unrealistic to think you're ever not going to feel those feelings. That's your brain's job. And it's always going to have a negativity bias and a knee-jerk reaction to things that make it scared. But what you can do is become mindful and what you're really doing in your brain is moving the control of what's happening and your, your thoughts and your mind and your behavior to your frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is basically our humanness and our superior intelligence. And when you move from your limbic system, the fear center reacting to your frontal lobe, you can consider what's going to be in my best interest. What, how do I want to behave? What kind of life do I want to build? Who do I want to be? And then you can decide and you can act in a way that reinforces that. And over time, like we talked about neuroplasticity with repetition, time and consistency, your brain will actually form new connections and rewire itself to reinforce those patterns and make those more of, they may never be the default, but they can be the easier go-tos. Now, the default, is that based on what we've learned over time that we've formed and, and then we're essentially rewiring another way of tapping into something we want to see more of. Is that kind of the way to look at it? It doesn't go away. It's just more, we have this new opportunity to tap into this new way of thinking. For example, like I'm looking to have more joy and happiness wherever I am, the community workplace. So I'm looking for that all the time. So that's in my front lobe. And I love how you said humanness, because that's perfect. It almost allows us to truly connect in the world. Am I thinking about that the right way? Um, yeah, the, the default pathways that we we have when we arrive at young adulthood are formed by our environments, our fears, the experiences that our brain took note of 
your brain doesn't really keep track of or care about all the wonderful things that happened, mm. but it's going to keep track of and remember all the bad things and all the things that scared you. So think about it. Your brain is wired that way. It's wired to avoid. It's not wired to approach and to achieve and to get happy. And your brain notices all the bad. It So we, we have to consciously repave and remake those connections and those pathways and look for good things and even create good things. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I said, I'm I'm still anxious and my my initial reaction is always going to be anxious. And I don't want to override that because you want to be able to react when you need to. I mean, you want your brain to be able to keep you safe when it needs to. But what I've learned to do, what anybody can learn to do is stop and realize I'm having those feelings and then insert intelligence and say, okay, that is my initial reaction because of my anxiety or my fear from the past. What do I want to do? Even if it scares me, maybe I want to go in a direction that terrifies me because I know it'll be the biggest gain or the biggest growth for me. The whole point is to consciously live your life and not let your brain and your instincts and your reflexes be in control because that's how I made a big mess of my life. And it doesn't mean that everything is rainbows and glitter Mm. once you become mindful. It just means that I'm more equipped to handle life's challenges and when stressors do show up i can't support and encourage myself with my self-talk and choose what's going to be the path in my best interest and for my most gain rather than just wrapped and try to avoid and run away because that doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah, you're right. It's limiting, especially the reaction without the thought being of being conscious and seeing what's there, even the possibilities of what's good or, or what could be joyful. Could you extend this a little bit to say this can help help our listeners really improve our own levels of happiness uh, and reduce some of the negative aspects of depression? Does that kind of oh, reverse definitely. the course? Oh, definitely. Um, There are all kinds of scientific studies that show that you can call it mindfulness. It's also called thought reframing or cognitive dissonance. I mean, there are all kinds of things you can call it, but let's just call it becoming aware and using your brain consciously. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are all kinds of studies confirming that it calms your amygdala the fear center in your brain, it can make you have a happier outlook. It can cure depressions, depressive symptoms. Um, you can increase your focus, your attention skills with, with by doing this. ADHD, um, it helps PTSD. Almost any mental health or brain condition can benefit by mindfully and consciously becoming aware of and guiding your brain. Yeah, that's, that's so helpful and encouraging. And and I know you have several articles out on your website, which I will definitely add to the, uh, the show notes, because I think there's so many different ways to think about how we could leverage our brain because it can change and grow. That it's so powerful. And it's, to me, it's hopeful because it's, it can, you know, we can change in the way we want uh, how do you how do you think about this with how we view other people? Because I just feel today, no matter where we are, there's so much divisiveness. I feel like there's hatred and people are stuck in their ways. And I don't feel like people are are reaching out to people in a human way, like using that humanness element that you talk you talked about. 
how, how can this help us view other people differently and actually walk the world in in a different way? Well, it does make us more empathetic. And I know it's made me personally more understanding because you realize that everybody is a product of, and their brains are a product of their upbringing mm. or their environment. Now, we all have the opportunity and responsibility at some point as adults to say, okay, I'm going to consciously choose who I am rather than just this is the way I am. But there are scientific studies that show mindfulness, awareness, increase empathy and decrease discrimination, bigotry. And if you think about it, one of the main basics of mindfulness and meditation is finding the common humanness and suffering in humanity globally. Well, not just humanity, but all living beings. And there's a specific kind of meditation called loving kindness meditation, which that is what you do. You send out energy and receive energy from all living beings and wish all living beings kindness. And it helps us realize we're not so different. Mm. I mean, at the core, we all want the same things. We may express it differently. Yeah. We, I, yeah. We're all unique. Yeah. There's so many commonalities. And I think that's a great way to think about it. our commonalities is really what connects us. And yet I think our differences is what makes us all unique and beautiful. And that's something that for me, I didn't realize I was, I was changing in this way with mindfulness from the standpoint of, Hey, there's a, there's a beautiful light inside of all of us. There's this beautiful way. There's this, this ability that we all bring. And I think I limited myself to thinking to say, Hey, over time, people, certain people could do certain things. And I saw people differently just based on the way I was taught. I had to, I had to recognize they needed to change. So everything you're saying, I think I lived it too. Just I'm taking different steps intentionally to welcome every single human in, in my mind to say they have so much potential. They have a beautiful light. Let's tap into that together and, and show people they can. And using the skills and the, and the tips that you're providing, I think is a great, is a great augmentation to help people really thrive. So it's fascinating. Now you have a, an article that's out there. You talk about some quirky elements of a brain. Are there any that come to mind? Any of the te- I think there's 10 quirky elements that you shared in that article. Are there any that were of interest to you that, that pops in your mind? Well, I think the main one that I want to stress is that your brain can change. Yeah. And not just me, but everybody's brain. It takes intentional effort to do it. But we all can change our brains. And when you change your brain, you change your life. You can change your mental health. You can even change your physical health. But there are all kinds of things like, um, did you know your brain produces enough electricity to power a light bulb? No, that's pretty cool. (laughs) I recall seeing, you know, the effects of giving back out in the world. That seems to, does that, I guess, how does that affect our brain? You know, giving back, providing levels of charity, um, having, you know, certain experiences, those type of things. Volunteering and acts of kindness, uh, believe it or not, are one way that you can alleviate depression symptoms. Okay. Because it allows our brain not to introspect over too much like concentrate on our own problems and feelings and giving back benefits or giving benefits the giver's brain as well as the recipients. Our brains are social. We need other people to actually survive and be healthy. Interacting with others releases certain chemicals like serotonin, oxytocin, um, 
that our brains need to stay happy and healthy. And volunteering and social interaction are one of the ways. There's an epidemic right now of depression and anxiety, especially after the pandemic. Mm. But I consider mental health a lifestyle. And I exercise almost every day. I meditate. I eat a healthy diet most of the time. I try to get social interaction. I get enough sleep. I mean, being mentally healthy and feeling healthy and happy, a lot of time are in your habits. And you can reinforce that or you can reinforce being unhealthy. And I certainly used to reinforce being unhealthy. And I'm not saying I'm healthy all the time. I'm just saying I know how to keep myself on track. And if I get on tr- get off track now, I know how to right the ship and get back on course. Yeah, that's great. I, I feel like the, there's patterns here, as you're saying, as we notice that we continue to do things that might be harmful to our bodies. Like, you know, I loved how you brought in exercise and food. And we all kind of say, yeah, we, yeah, no kidding. Yet I think a lot of these elements to mental health and self-care it's all these things that we're not doing that we know, but we're we're not really actually taking intentional actions on everything you're saying that if we, if we really put these together, we actually have control of our brain. Exactly. And I'm not anti-medication. Medication can help and is necessary, certainly in some circumstances, but you can't just take a pill and expect everything to be okay. You've got to live a life that encourages health and happiness. And that's proven as well. Yeah. Now, what's your take on manifesting in life? Because I've heard different speakers talk about, hey, if you put it out there, it can happen or it does happen. And I feel like it's connected to your your components related to the front lobe. And what's your take on manifestation though? Well, I'm not a big believer in the law of attraction. That's kind of like a universal vending machine. (laughs) I don't think you can just think good thoughts and or put the energy out there and things will materialize. Mm. I think you have to walk the walk and make decisions and put effort into daily habits and daily actions that reinforce what you want. I did a blog, which I thought was really interesting, on mindset. And I think the person that did all the research, and I'm very research-based, everything I'm saying is backed up by science. I, like I said, I don't believe in just think positive. Yeah. But they said it was a, the block was on luck. And do you know what they said? The research said is the biggest predictor of whether you're lucky or not. It's not random. I'd love to hear this. The biggest predictor of luck is if you look for opportunities. So after I wrote that, I I work at a university and I fight for parking with all the students. And I got to the point where I would just park at the athletic stadium and walk five minutes to work because I got tired of driving around looking for place. But after I wrote that and read that, I said, okay, I'm just going to make the loop to see if I can find a parking space. And you know what? I would say four times out of five, I would find a space. But what I was doing is I was automatically parking five minutes away. So I wasn't giving myself a chance to be lucky. Yeah, you got to take the steps. And I agree with you. You got to take the actions. It's you got to do the hard work sometimes or the work that will support something that you're putting out there, an idea, a thought, something you believe in, you know, believing something without action, uh, you know, it's got a little empty, right? I think it's, you know, it's walking the talk. Like you said, I love that. 
And, you know, I, I have to say, this is really, really impressive. Uh, the fact that you went from this place, this, this dark place, and now you're, you're literally shining as you're sharing your knowledge and you're digging in and learn, you know, doing the work, learning all the aspects of, of the brain and how it works and how it can grow. And I know you have a book coming out, which I'm excited to get into that when that comes out. So let me know when that's available, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your two books that you have written. Okay, I have one called Beat Depression and Anxiety by Changing Your Brain. And that tells all about neuroplasticity and how to harness it to benefit you and your mental health. And the comment I get most about that book is how simple it is to understand and that I put it in layman terms. And I like to say I have to put it in terms that I can understand. So it's it's based on neuroscience, but it's not complicated. And my second book is called Sex, Suicide, and Serotonin. And it's my memoir about how I got to the place in life that I thought the answer was ending my life. And about the attempt and the aftermath where things got way worse before they got better, but it was about how I rebuilt my brain, my life, and everything in my life. And you don't have to go to that extreme, hopefully, but all of us can do that. What it takes is the decision to do it and the daily effort. Yeah, I'll definitely put links to those books out here for everybody to take a look at. I think that I think it's wonderful that you're sharing your story so vulnerably and courageously. Are there any other fun things that we should know about you? What do you like? What do you do for fun? What do you do to keep yourself happy in other ways? Well, I'm pretty boring. I work a lot. <laughs> um, for fun, I, I'm a big hot yoga holic. Do you know what hot yoga is? Yes, I've. I've done a, I guess a, a power yoga, which is a version of that, because it really, uh, it really hit me pretty good. It was pretty, pretty intense. Well, this is yoga in hundred degrees yeah. and like forty percent humidity. Wow! And I, it was very a very integral healing part of my journey, my healing journey, physically and mentally. But, and I actually went on to own a yoga studio, which closed during COVID. And, but I'm still a hot yoga holic. I, mean, I will be uh, probably, I want to be one of those old 100 year old women doing yoga. But I also have a garden that I eat out of pretty much all summer. And I have seven cats. Oh, that, that'll keep you busy too. Yeah, you lit up there with the seven cats. So the pets make you happy. I can tell the cats. They're my family. I love them. <laughs> They're really good cuddlers. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm happy to hear that you're thinking about uh what it's gonna look like at a hundred. You know, you're you're living your life and I'm so happy for you. And I'm sorry you've gone through what you have. And you know, thanks for sharing your story. Hopefully it'll help some folks to think about. Uh, things they can do to uh, keep their life really thriving and active. And, and for many too, to figure out how we could actually re rewire, retrace, rethink and relearn, because I think there's so much to live in this lifetime that you're showing us is, is ahead. So, I you know, I want to just ask one last question. If there's anything you want to give advice to, or any other tips to our audience. Well, like you said, it's empowering to realize that we all have a power already. We don't have to spend money or find somebody with some expertise. We all have the power to change our brains and our lives. And it's in what we do every single day. The decisions, the little small decisions you make today will determine the life and the brain you have in the future. Yeah, thank you. And I love how all this is based in science and in reality because you've lived this. So not only am I a believer, I'm inspired. Uh, I'm very grateful for you to be on the show, Debbie. Thanks for sharing everything today. Well, thanks, Darren. I've really enjoyed it. Debbie's story is such an inspiration. We can rewire our brains. 
what a relief to know this. However, it's not possible without being intentional and taking action. Changing habits takes time and good repetition, as Debbie pointed out. I went deeper into Debbie's research and pulled out the following elements to help you believe you can also change. The brain is not fixed. It can grow up until we die. Breaking a habit requires a change in the brain. This change must be a conscious effort to become a new habit or norm. When we do this, we create more serotonin in our brains, leading to living healthier and being present to enable change. Debbie shows that science reinforces that positive self-reflection helps significantly establish these new habits. As you begin, don't beat yourself up and commit to improving. Lastly, find people who encourage you, want to help you see positive change, and is willing to change themselves. These are the steps I believed in and took with my friends and daily challenges that reward my thinking to see more expansively to welcome all the possibilities waiting to be noticed. With this commitment, you can be your happy, authentic self and live your possible. Now, I am living proof of this along with our guest, Debbie Hamp. That's all for today's episode. If you liked the show, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Live Your Possible dares to unlock your fullest potential and become an avenue for others to do the same. Join the community by visiting ignitehappy.com. It's time to discover endless possibilities with equal opportunity for all. See you again next week for more insights on how you can live your possible.